we left off speaking about actually criteria. And I really appreciate, I appreciate you introducing me to Professor McDonald. I appreciate the time that we had interacting and you know, raising objections, I believe is important. And also he shared with me the benefit of his experience of being in academia for you know, a number of decades, knowing the standards the burden of proof, so to speak, that's a, obviously a term from a court of law and in a court of law, for good reasons, there are really high burden of proof to prove that somebody has done something guilty. We have a presumption of innocence, but he really emphasized something that I took to heart. You have to maybe, uh, not maybe, you have to come up with a way of establishing your criteria. So it's not just well, I'm speculating about this, that, and the other thing. And that would be something that I have not formally laid out, although I have, of course, in my own mind, thought about, well, this myth has stronger support. So this is one that I'm going to show. And this is a good example right here, where we have Vishnu reclining on Sheshanag or Sheshnag with Lakshmi, and a lotus growing out of his navel. We have a number of specific clues. And just as you know, in the interview with Professor McDonald that you did previous to my meeting him, he said, some of my passages here, I will admit, are weaker. Some passages are very strong where we have a lot of evidence. It's the same thing with the myths where sometimes I will say, this passage here in the Bible or in some other myth, is not full of evidence. For instance, I always get asked about Genesis 6, the sons of God. That passage itself doesn't contain a lot of description of the sons of God and the daughters of men. There are parallel passages in other myth systems, such as Mesopotamian, where we can find other clues. So it would be good to formally set out, well, in a passage where I have three or more celestial correspondences which have clear reference to specific details of a constellation or characteristics of a constellation that we have seen before. For instance, I talked about the woman walking in one direction and looking back in the other direction. It's often a woman. That is a characteristic of Sagittarius. As we can see on the screen, the stars themselves look like they're the figure is walking one way and turning back the other way. That is a distinctive characteristic of Sagittarius and one other constellation that we'll talk about. And where we have other myths or multiple references in a text, say three or more, I would say that the argument is very strong. And here in this image of Vishnu, we have definitely more than three. And there are connections to other myths as well, the multi-headed serpent, uh, a god or a hero fighting a multi-headed serpent or dancing on the heads of a multi-headed serpent or slaying a serpent. Professor McDonald mentioned Apollo, the twin brother of Artemis. We've established that Artemis is associated with Sagittarius and I have other details that can help establish that to make the burden of proof even, you know, the, the standard, the criteria even higher. Well, Apollo is the twin brother of Artemis. He also uses a bow he famously slays or chases away the python, the, the great serpent python, usually identified as a female serpent, at Delphi or Delphi. And then the smoke rises up, the vapors rise up from her body. Well, you can see Sagittarius pointing a bow at Scorpio, a great serpent in the sky. It's even more large and impressive. And you can see the smoke rising up the Milky Way, the vapors. You can even see the tripod in Ophiuchus. I've, I've gone a little bit um, off on a tangent. I can show Greek vases where Hercules is playing tug of war with the tripod of Delphi or Delphi. Hercules and Apollo are both trying to wrestle that tripod from one another. Well, look at Hercules right up above Ophiuchus. I'm arguing Ophiuchus is the tripod above the serpent. 
look at Sagittarius, which I've just said is Apollo, when we have those kinds of details piling up, then the criteria is much stronger. But there are myths where I will say, I suspect it's this, but we only have really one clue in the text. And I don't have a lot of parallel myths to point to. But when we do have a lot of parallel myths, then it's, it's more powerful. And I would say you, knew, you do need to get beyond, quote, a reasonable doubt, doubt. That's one of the terms we use in the court system in the United States, beyond a reasonable doubt. Like I said, this isn't a courtroom proceeding, but those kinds of criteria are important. And uh, um, Professor McDonald's point is well taken. So I will start to maybe be a little more formal about that in the future. But I have been doing it kind of informally and thinking about it, obviously, for the 13 plus years now that I've been looking at these. So we have the Lotus there. I thought that was a very strong uh, piece of evidence that links to the Odyssey. And I just, before I leave this image and go to the remainder of the slides that we weren't able to get to, I appreciate the opportunity to just kind of go through those at a fairly rapid pace to show the rest of the evidence that I was wanting to present about the Odyssey. And it's by no means all of it. I'm hoping to have in the future a complete course on the Odyssey. But I do want to mention, again, uh, earlier in the conversation with Professor McDonald, I mentioned the sash that is given by a goddess to Odysseus. And I said, there are parallels in the myth, uh, in other myths as well, for a sash often given by a female figure or a goddess. In this case, it's the goddess Leucothea in the Odyssey in book five of the Odyssey. They, they divide the Odyssey instead of into chapters, they call them books, uh, 24 books of the Odyssey, but um, it's like chapter five, book five of the Odyssey. She gives him a sash. And I said briefly, as we were going through in the conversation earlier, that this is also like the sash or the girdle, which is like a belt. The girdle usually has a feminine, it's like a feminine article of clothing. It's given to the green knight, uh, not to the green knight, but to Sir Gawain in the medieval poem of Gawain and the green knight by a female figure, the, uh, the queen who turns out to be the wife of the green knight. This is a strong parallel to the Odyssey where a goddess who used to be immortal gives a sash, an item of her clothing to Odysseus to protect him. And in this story of the Green Knight, the, it's not a goddess, it's the queen. She gives her girdle, it's a belt, to protect Sir Gawain from the Green Knight, who is a menacing figure who has a gigantic axe. Well, look right above Ophiuchus, and you can see Hercules. Is, he is a menacing figure in the sky. And it's not always he. All of these constellations play both male or female characters from time to time in different myths and different uh, sacred stories and legends. So Hercules does play some female figures, but usually Hercules is a powerful figure in a deep lunging posture with a very powerful weapon, the thunderbolt, <clears throat> excuse me, the thunderbolt for Zeus, the Thor's hammer, in the myth of the Green Knight, it's a powerful axe that he's going to use to cut off the head of Sir Gawain. And that's why Sir Gawain puts on the sash or the girdle. And there is a precedent for an axe associated with a thunder god, a thunder sky god. So Hercules is associated with Zeus. He's also associated with Thor. So that I can show how that there are stars that make that that weapon, you can envision it as a hammer, you can envision it as an ax, and there is another thunder deity who has an ax. He is a god, or an Orisha, of the Yoruba nation, or Yoruba people of Africa, West Africa, the region of Nigeria, and there's been a Yoruba diaspora, so, um, you know, there's a lot of history of enslavement and transportation to the new world and the Yoruba myths, there is a god who is a thunder and fire god, Shango, who has a powerful axe in a full beard, just like Hercules and Zeus. So those kinds of criteria, I just wanted to address that. It's very uh, 
important point. And when we have multiple precedents like that, then I think it establishes the case more strongly. So I did want to address what I find to be one of the most powerful parallels between the Gospels and the Odyssey. And it is found in one of the critical parts of the Odyssey, one of the climactic moments really of the Odyssey or um, the underworld visit that Odysseus has to go down to the underworld and consult Tiresias. We'll talk about it in a minute. There is a very clear parallel to some passages that are found in most three out of four gospels about um, this winnowing fan. So in the baptism scene, first of all, I put up this beautiful artwork from, I believe it's the 1300s to the 1200s or the 1300s by someone named Brother Angelico or Fra Angelico. You can see a river. Of course, in the story, there's a river, the River Jordan, but you can see a river. You can see a dove descending we talked about Leucothea, the goddess, coming down the Milky Way to visit Odysseus. I said Odysseus is just wearing a sash. He has to take off all his clothes and dive into the water, just wearing the sash of the goddess. Look at Jesus. He's always depicted with just a sash at the baptism scene. And I call, you know, Odysseus being having to jump into the ocean, prompted by a goddess who's in the shape of a bird a baptism scene. It's at the start of his adventures. And you can see pictures of Jesus. Sometimes the sash does go off to the side, just like the Ophiuchus serpent. But in this passage from, this is, I'm citing the passage from Matthew, but we could find it in some of the other gospels as well. There is this passage about John saying, when he's asked, who are you? He says, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the one. And there's one coming after me. And he says this very interesting thing. I've underlined it there in Matthew 3, 12, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly or thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. This is a specific type of a fan that we're going to talk about. And in the Odyssey, this is a statue that survived that we believe is a statue depicting Odysseus. He is a man of sorrows just like Jesus is a man of sorrows. He suffers. Pardon me, <clears throat> just clear my throat. He suffers. He has these adventures. And I give Professor McDonald all the credit for his very important documentation of these parallels. You know, I am going further and saying this is a worldwide system. It is a much more, um, you know, ambitious thing to try and prove and i can understand the, the uh, you know reticence in the scholarly community it's as if somebody would come up to me and say well this is all because of aliens i would say okay you know i'm open to that possibility but you have a very high burden of proof i have not found evidence that this requires aliens at all i would be i would push back against that um but I would, I just as Professor McDonald was open um, in many ways, I'm open to you got to show me a lot of evidence. So, anyway, I think that this evidence requires a comprehensive addition to our knowledge about the myths or a, a new look, a new angle on the myths. And um, that's going to change a lot of what we understand about the myths. But I give Professor McDonald absolute pride of place in terms of this re-evaluation uh, of the myths. He has shown parallels that have been resisted, but those parallels are clearly there. Um, so he is um, in this reworking and relook at the, the myths. I think he has gone a long way with his work that's really important. And he's seen a lot of parallels that I haven't seen. So but that I agree <laughs> when, when he showed some of those parallels yesterday in our conversation, I hadn't seen, you know, some of those that he immediately made to, let's say the ship journey of Paul. So anyway, here's, here's uh, Odysseus. And there's this passage where he goes down to meet the shades in the underworld and Tiresias specifically, he's been told to do this by the 
goddess Circe. She's a, also some, something of a threatening, menacing figure. She turns Odysseus's crew into various animals, mostly into swine. I believe this is all esoteric metaphor that has to do with our journey here on this earth. But Odysseus is told, you have to go find Tiresias. And Tiresias gives very specific instructions to Odysseus. You have angered the god Poseidon. Here is what you are going to need to do. After you get home, he says, once you've killed all those suitors that are lounging around in your house, devouring all your food without work, trying to kill your son and marry your wife, after you've taken care of that situation, you need to go inland. Take a well-planed oar, it says. Your oar, you're a man of the sea. You go out in boats. You've sailed around the world. You need to take your oar and start marching inland until you find a place where the people are so ignorant of the sea that they don't know it's an oar. And they call that oar across your shoulder. A traveler is going to start walking alongside you and he'll say, hey, why do you have a winnowing fan on your shoulder? Why do you have a fan to winnow grain? Take your well-planed oar, and when another traveler falls in with you and calls that weight across your shoulder, why are you carrying that thing, that fan to winnow grain? Then you'll know that you've reached a place where people know nothing of the sea. Plant that oar in the ground and make a shrine to Poseidon. And Professor McDonald has talked about this specific passage in relation to an apocryphal text called the Acts of Andrew, where Andrew is told to plant the cross in a very similar manner. And that's a great parallel. There is also this very important parallel to John the Baptist and the baptism scene that I want to just briefly uh, touch on. So here's the sky again. This is slightly, the, the sky has progressed along as the earth is turning. The stars move from east to west, just like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I'm going to draw in the horizon line. I'm using a program called Stellarium, a very, very helpful free online. You can download. The downloadable version is much more robust than the online web-based version. You can download Stellarium for free. It's an open source project. It's a wonderful planetarium app. This is a screenshot from Stellarium, and I have it oriented to where we are facing south. You can see the letter S down at the bottom of your screen. So that means if we're facing south, the left side of our screen is the east, and the right side is the west. You can just think about it. If you're facing north, east is to the right. Well, we're facing south. So east is to the left. That means as we're turning on the earth, we're turning towards the east. That's why New York is three hours ahead of California in their time zone. And you, esoteric, are even farther ahead. So we're turning towards the east. That means things are going to rise in the east, like the sun but also all the other things in the sky rise in the east. The stars rise in the east because we're turning that way. I'm spending a bit of time on it because it's important to this interpretation that I'm going to lay out. So we're facing south. The Milky Way and some of the constellations that we've seen have moved further west and some have even sunk down below the horizon on the right side of our screen. So I'm going to introduce you to some new parts of the sky here. And I'm going to start with Oh, and we're facing south. So I just wrote in south. So now we've got east, south, and west. I'm going to start with, uh, after I show that the objects in the sky <laughs> rotate from east to west, just keep that in mind. All these constellations are rising out of the horizon on your left, moving across the sky in this beautiful arc like this, sinking down to the right, to the west. Now I'll take that out of the way so I can show some constellations. Who do you think might be, just if you had to guess, John the Baptist, if I said, I suspect John the Baptist relates to a specific constellation. Now, John the Baptist is a, <laughs> he's a complicated figure, so he may have some other constellations, but esoteric, do you want to take a guess, like who might Various. dip water? <laughs> yeah, who, who, who would sprinkle water on people? Aquarius, number one answer. So that is the outline of Aquarius. I would suspect Aquarius just without any evidence whatsoever. And let me just bring back John the Baptist. There's the outline of Aquarius. 
there's John the Baptist in the 1300s or, four, or uh, 1200s or 1300s. Is this conclusive evidence that John the Baptist is associated with Aquarius? No, it is not. I, I'm willing to grant that. So I'm going to give some more evidence that at least sometimes John the Baptist is associated with Aquarius. So let me take that picture out of the way so we can see a text. Here's one from John chapter 3 verse 29 and of course john is a gospel that is different than what we call the synoptic gospels it has some different themes and different emphasis but this is the only place that this passage is found in john 3 29 john looking sees jesus coming and says behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world and i've just drawn in what constellation might be a lamb or associated with sheep, that would be Aries, Aries the ram. And Aries is a ram, it's not a lamb. And there are some faint stars which make curving horns, but the outline of HK Ray, which I'm using HK Ray's outlining system here, shows it without the horns, they're very faint. Aries could be a ram, Aries could be a lamb in different stories around the world different myths, and within the Bible, as I was mentioning before we started up, I have now, my most recent work that I've published out there is online courses. I have now published four complete online courses. Each one is around 10 hours long. Some are longer than 10 hours. One of them is a little bit shorter than 10 hours, but each course, 10 hours of content. You can watch at your own pace. Well, watch it over and over. One of them is the Celestial Bible Tour Part 1 which does get into the story of Abraham, for instance, where there's a ram caught in the thicket, um, the Celestial Bible Tour. I've got Celestial Bible Tour Part 1 and 2, and then I have Celestial Mechanics and the Myths, which goes into some of the comprehensive structure of this myth system, as, as I understand it so far. And one's called Recovering Our Deeper Self, because as we've talked about, I am convinced that one of the central themes of this whole system is to alert us to the fact that we suppress our own self, that our own self has these tremendous aspects to it that are very positive and points us towards reconciliation with and recovery of self. So anyway, uh, not to get off of what I was explaining here, John sees Jesus says, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And look at Aquarius. It looks like in the sky, it is looking directly towards Aries. So now we're getting more evidence, which I would say is starting to be more convincing. But I wouldn't have put it up here if this wasn't a very strong argument. And I'm going to relate it to the Odyssey. There is still more in the text, which gives us confidence that this interpretation has validity, but this is one pretty strong piece of evidence. Aquarius, just the outline itself looks towards Aries, and in the text, the figure associated with dipping people with water says, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And I'm going to bring in more texts. This is from Matthew. We've looked at this passage before. I had it up on the other screen. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. I'm just going to underline, he that cometh after me is mightier than I. And then it goes on in verse 12 to say, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly or thoroughly, that's an older form of English. I'm using the King James or 1611 translation, authorized version. He will thoroughly purge his floor. We're talking about a specific type of fan. But he that cometh after me is a celestial clue, I'm going to argue here. So we spent a little bit of time saying the constellations rotate this way. No matter where you are in the world, things rise in the east and set in the west. This is a northern hemisphere looking south because in the Northern Hemisphere, we look south to see the Zodiac. We're going to look for a constellation that cometh after Aquarius in the sky. And it's mightier than Aquarius. And 
This is a constellation that most people are familiar with because it is a very bright constellation. It doesn't look much mightier than Aquarius on the screen, but this is the constellation Orion, the famous three star belt, but also a lot of other bright stars. There's Betelgeuse in the upper shoulder. There's Rigel in the foot. It has the high, highest percentage of bright stars to total stars, according to H.A. Ray, of any constellation, and it is big. It is bigger than Aquarius. Stellarium does some things with perspective to where things are smaller when they're on the edges and they get bigger. Um, actually, they're bigger on the edges. But anyway, Orion is way easier to see in the sky than Aquarius. I would suggest that probably most viewers have seen Orion. <laughs> Most viewers probably have not been able to pick out the stars of Aquarius. It is faint. It is difficult to see. It is up in the sky right now, but Orion is mightier looking than Aquarius. I mean, Aquarius is bent forward like it's running. Orion is striding and raising up what looks like a club or something and holding out a bow or something. Like it's a mighty looking conversation, uh, constellation, not conversation, in the sky. And it comes after Aquarius. That is, he that cometh after me is mightier than I, his, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat. We know what kind of fan he's talking about. It's the same fan Tiresias was talking about. It is a fan to winnow grain. We're talking about a winnowing fan. And what is winnowing? Well, it's actually a word from Old English. It means to use the wind. It's a wind using fan. It's a fan for separating grain from chaff. And here I have a picture of a woman in modern day in, uh, this is in Northern India, in Uttarakhand, India, way up by the Himalayas. She is using a winnowing fan to winnow, in this case, rice. She's separating the grain from the chaff using the wind and the chaff is lighter it's going to separate into a different pile of the grain it's going to fall straight down the chaff the wind is going to move the chaff off to the side it's a way of separating out the wheat from the chaff or the good stuff from the bad stuff and look at the similarities to orion i've just argued that orion is he that cometh after that is mightier comes after aquarius aquarius said, behold the Lamb of God. And then he said, there's someone coming after that's mightier than me with a fan in his hand to winnow out the grain, to separate the wheat from the chaff. And there's all kinds of, you know, metaphorical, metaphorical uh, connotations to that. But I'm just going to make Orion a little bigger here since it's kind of small on the screen so everyone can see the parallels. Look, she, she could not look more like Orion with that winnowing fan she's got there's the outline of Orion, the powerful looking constellation of Orion. There's an actual woman winnowing grain in modern day in a full color photograph. I, I think I've established that that's a winnowing fan. So what, what's going on in the, uh, well, we'll get to the Odyssey in just one second. There's one more. So establishing, you know, burden of proof, establishing additional pieces of evidence. There's one more passage from John John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven, these are constellations in the sky. He must increase, but I must decrease. I think now when I say this is celestial language, everyone can now understand Oh, that actually does sound like celestial language. We're talking about constellations. Orion is rising, going up towards the center of the sky. The highest point of the stars and the sun is in the center of their journey. I must decrease. I am sinking down into the west at the time that Orion is rising. When Aquarius is sinking down into the west and decreasing and going off the scene, Orion is rising. You could even argue that Aquarius, when he gets to the horizon, he's going to sink down. His legs are going to get obscured first, then his torso. And all that's going to be left on the horizon at the end is going to be that water jug and the head of John the Baptist. 
Mm. Uh, but these these uh, violent scenes in different myths can almost always be shown to be celestial, just like the lotus rising up out of the navel, which seems bizarre, has a very clear celestial explanation. The beheading of John the Baptist may, I stress may, have to do with Aquarius sinking down onto the horizon and all that's left to see when he's sinking down is the head sticking above the horizon. I'm not positive about that one, so I just throw that out there as a, a speculation you can think about. Now, Odysseus goes down to the underworld. This is actually an ancient piece of pottery um, with Odysseus in the, underwor in the underworld. Before he goes, He's given instructions. There's a disuse in the center. He's got a knife in his hand. He's got a bunch of, he's sitting kind of on an altar of, excuse me, of stones. And he's got a, a, a sheep at his feet. He's with his two companions, Eurylochus and Paramedes. I just put their names up there. I'm not sure which the artist has. Uh, Eurylochus is like his second in command, but I just want to point out the figure on the left, most scholars think that's probably Eurylochus and the other one's Paramedes, it could be the other way around. But that figure has crossed legs and is wearing a Phrygian cap or a peaked cap. Those are celestial details and is wearing kind of a, a cloak with curly cues. I just point that out on the left, that figure on the left. But look down at the feet of that figure on the left. This ancient artist has depicted Tiresias down there. The reason Odysseus is told to go to the underworld, you got to Make a sacrifice that'll draw the shades of the dead to come to drink the blood. And Tiresias will come. You keep the other shades away until you've spoken with Tiresias. The ancient artist has put the head of Tiresias down there. The dead shade of Tiresias has come. And I'm going to make that bigger so you can see it right at the foot of Odysseus. You see his foot. You see a head down there. I'm going to blow it up bigger. There's Odysseus's foot on the right. There's the head of the sage. He's got a long beard. His eyes are just closed in death, but he's going to give a prophecy to Odysseus. So I'll move that out of the way. And I'm going to discuss this scene with the text itself because the textual evidence is very clear, pointing to some celestial references that I wanted to share. I've talked about this in a book that I published in 2016, Star of the World Volume 2. And in this passage, this is in book 10 of the Odyssey. The actual visit to the dead is book 11. But in book 10, Circe tells Odysseus, you have to go to the underworld. And Odysseus says, oh, no, not that. I don't want to go to the underworld Any, anywhere but that. It's very dangerous. Circe says, you're right. So I'm going to give you very clear instructions. Here's what you've got to do. And this is the lustrous goddess here is talking about Circe on uh, page 246. This is from the translation of Professor Robert Fagels, whom I mentioned, he's now passed, but he translated the Odyssey in 1999. He also translated the Aeneid uh, later on after the Odyssey that Professor uh, McDonald was referring to the Aeneid. I'm, quite certain there are celestial references in the Aeneid. There are, but uh, like Professor McDonald was saying, it's, it's much later work than the Odyssey. And the Odyssey is really much more of a, a primary source for myths, I would argue. It goes back into, you know, it's connected to the system somehow in a much more direct way. But uh, this is a really important passage. She says, when you get down to the underworld, you're going to see these landmarks. You need to beach your vessel by the ocean's churning store, shore, just above the part that I've outlined, and make your own way down to the moldering house of death. This translation by Professor Fagels, I really love this translation. I think it's the best one yet. And there, into Acheron, the flood of grief, two rivers flow the torrent river of fire, the wailing river of tears. So two rivers, you're going to know that there's, you're in the right spot when two rivers are flowing into Acheron, the flood of grief, and then branches off, uh, the, the river of tears branches off from the river Styx. So there's all these rivers in the underworld. 
well, I've identified their location in the heavens. We'll see these two rivers coming together near where. So that's like a clue, one piece of evidence for this interpretation that I'm going to offer. And then she says, you got to do just what I say. You're going to dig a trench of about a forearm's depth and length, about a forearm's depth and length. And around it, pour libations out to all the dead, first with milk and honey, then with mellow wine. I'm reading from the passage that I've outlined. And down at the bottom, she says, slaughter a ram, a ram. Remember that. We just talked about a ram in the heavens. And a black ewe. So this is a female sheep. So two sheep, a ram and a ewe. You're going to slaughter them, turning both their heads toward Erebus. That's another, world for, another word for the underworld. You're going to turn their heads towards the underworld, but turn your head away. So Odysseus, you got to look the other way. Point their heads one way. You look the other way looking toward the ocean river, okay? And this is how you're going to meet up with Tiresias. So here's the constellations we've already looked at in the John the Baptist scene. I'm going to argue we're dealing with the same part of the sky because we've got a ram and a ewe that are being featured in the text. And then we've got these two rivers, and then we've got the ocean river. Here again is the Milky Way. This is the fainter part of the Milky Way. This is the other side from the galactic core, but it's arching over the whole scene. It's rising up. You can still see on the right side, the two great birds in the Milky Way, Cygnus and Aquila, the swan and the eagle that we talked about previously, but then they've moved off to the west. This is going, this is really the other side of the sky from the scorpion. Orion is on the other side of the sky from the scorpion, almost exact opposite. So the whole sky turns once a day, because the earth turns once a day, on the opposite side of the dome of the heavens, not a real dome, we call it that, you know, metaphorically, is Orion from the Scorpions. So Scorpio goes down, Orion comes up. So this is the other side of the Milky Way from the bright part that is near Scorpio. But there, in between Aquarius and Aries, is the constellation Pisces. You may think it's a stretch, I talk about it a lot more in my book, the 2016 book about the Greek myths. That is two rivers coming together. And there's a cliff described next to the two rivers, a, a frightening cliff or a threatening, menacing cliff. There's this constellation here. It's Cetus the whale. We get our word cetacean, which is a, a members of the whale family from this ancient word, Ketos, or Ketos in Greek, Cetus in Latin. Yeah, it's a whale. It actually plays a big rock or a cliff in many myths. I can establish that it would take me some hours to show you the many myths that Cetus plays a rock or a cliff next to the feature of Pisces, but it does. Just You may think that's a stretch. It's not super important that you trust me that those are the two rivers coming together, but it was very clear in the text. You're going to go near where the two rivers come together, then you're going to look away while you set up this sacrifice with the ram and the ewe, and you're going to point their heads the other way. Now, here is the outline of Perseus. So Perseus is a constellation that is actually named for a mythical figure, Perseus. Perseus is the hero who fights Medusa, the Gorgons, and Medusa. He has to bring back the head of Medusa. When he slays Medusa, he has to look the other way. He has to look the other way because if he looks at her, he'll turn to stone. Perseus, the constellation, plays the figure of Perseus in the myths, but plays other figures. All these constellations show up in different myths, playing different figures. Odysseus is not always associated with Perseus, but in this trip to the underworld, Odysseus is told to do some things that identify Perseus, Aries, Pisces, Cetus, we're in this part of the sky, and he's told, look away from the way the heads of the ram and the ewe are facing, look back towards the ocean river. The ocean river is the Milky Way. Perseus may not be super clear in this. He is looking the other way. He's looking towards the river. We even talked about, esoteric, you and I, the story of King Midas, where he's told to go dunk his head in the river in order to undo the terrible curse of 
the golden touch. So this is the same constellation. And I'm going to make it even clearer by making it bigger. But this is where Circe says, turn their heads towards the underworld. Turn your head the other way. Look at Aries is looking that way. Perseus is looking the other way of Aries. Or we can imagine Perseus looking the other way towards the ocean river, towards the ocean. And there's a the text itself. Turn your head away, looking towards the ocean river. Let me give you an even closer view. This way, I have bumped up the brightness of the Milky Way a little bit. So hopefully our viewers can see it. But I'm going to outline the Milky Way goes right along there. So if you, I'll take it away. You can see it's fainter over here. There's Perseus with his head in the Milky Way. I'm going to outline Perseus again for us. And we know that Perseus is looking the other way from the direction that Ares is looking, at least in some myths, because Perseus fights Medusa or has to slay Medusa and cut off her head. And in this text from the Odyssey, Circe says something kind of strange, dig a trench of about a forearm's length and depth. I would argue this is an obscure but important little clue. Look at Perseus. So Perseus has a distinctive peaked cap. I pointed out the peaked cap on the artwork. The artist associated it with like Eurylochus instead of Odysseus, but there's a peaked cap, Phrygian cap. Midas was the king of Phrygia. There's a curly Q kind of a cape or the other arm that has a curly, curly hand. That is sometimes envisioned as a billowing cape with a curly Q on it. Look at the curly Qs. Go back and look at Eurylochus. And also crossed legs. The feet of Perseus look all twisted, as we talked about in uh, our previous visit when we talked about some of the myths here. But it could be, instead of twisted, the feet are crossed. Like if you cross your right foot in front of your left foot, then your foot will be pointing the other way than the way it normally would. So that figure had his feet crossed. And this is an important symbol that we see in statues and things. I won't go into it, but we know that Perseus is associated with looking the other way because of the Medusa story. Oh, I, I got off track. The forearm trenched. Look, there's this like almost like a, a wand or a stick that Perseus is holding or an exaggerated forearm. In the text that says, dig a trench about the length of a forearm. And there's Perseus with a very distinctive forearm. I just pointed it out there. Um, and turn your head away, looking towards the ocean river. Well, we've identified the ocean river. Now I'm gonna show you Andromeda, the constellation Andromeda can be argued to be in the myth of Perseus, Medusa. So Perseus has to look away from Medusa. How do I know that Andromeda is a figure of Medusa? Because listeners may know when Perseus cuts off the head of Medusa, something miraculous pops out of her neck. Something pops out of the severed head after he severs her head and takes it back in the pouch that was given to him by the god Hermes. A beautiful winged horse springs from the neck of Medusa after Perseus cuts off her head, and it is Pegasus. And there is Pegasus in the sky, clearly springing out of the neck of Andromeda. So you might say, wait a minute, Andromeda is not Medusa. No, later Perseus rescues Andromeda. That's a different part of the myth. But in the heavens, Pegasus leaps out of the neck of Medusa. Pegasus is clearly leaping out of the neck of Andromeda. And there's a constellation right next to Andromeda called Perseus. He's got to look the other way. And in this text from the Odyssey, Odysseus is told, when you slay the ram and the ewe, point their heads one way, but you, Odysseus, you look back towards the ocean river, towards the Milky Way. So what's going on? I'm just going to wrap it up. I do have a couple encore things. If you have time and want to see a couple more parts of the Odyssey, I've got them. But this is kind of wrapping up. What's going on with this big picture? I love the Odyssey. I kind of referred to that in my 
introductory remarks when I was kind of introducing this topic to Professor McDonald. I've loved it since a child. I never suspected that it was based on the stars until after I taught it at West Point. But I didn't know that it was based on the stars when I taught it at West Point. And I remember there were all kinds of, you know, kind of educational little movies that were made in the 50s. Oh, we're trying to figure out where Odysseus goes. Oh, yeah, the, this, this might happen on the island of Sicily. This might all trying to figure it out as if it's a terrestrial journey. It's not. It's a celestial journey. What I'm showing here on the screen is the zodiac. It's, I call this the snow globe view. I got this also out of Stellarium. I love this view because it shows, you can show the path of the sun, the moon, and the stars. They go right through because of celestial mechanics, as I explained in one of my online courses. They go through this background of the sky that we call the zodiac. And you can see the sun off to the very left right there. When this part, when this snapshot was taken in Stellarium, the sun was moving through the constellation, background constellation of Aries. But the sun, moon, and, and planets move along this path. We call it the ecliptic. And the background stars of the ecliptic are the zodiac constellations. Well, Odysseus in the story can be shown to travel along mostly the zodiac path in particular, the part of the zodiac path that is the lower part of the zodiac path. This all has esoteric significance. He's traveling along the lower, the watery path. This incarnate life, we're in the realm of, we're in the lower realm. We're down here on earth. We're in bodies that are esoterically said to be made of earth and water, the lower two elements, clay. There's so many myths where Human beings, men and women, are made of clay by the gods, not just Adam and Eve. Adam is made of clay, but Prometheus makes men and women out of clay. It's the lower elements. We're down here. We're trapped in a human body, metaphorically speaking, of the lower elements. But we have this divine fire and air, the upper elements, baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit, John says. Someone coming after, I'm just baptizing with water. That's like the first stage. Someone later will baptize you with spirit, air, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath, and with fire, the upper elements, to represent that you, although you are in this lower realm, have higher self, have a divine self, a divine spark that's been um, mixed in <laughs> and trapped, and you've even forgotten it. So we have to remind you. We have to wake you up to this truth. And Odysseus, in this, the reason I love the Odyssey so much more even now than I did before is it is one of the clearest of the ancient myths that articulates this esoteric theme that down here, we travel along the, the ecliptic, the lower path of the ecliptic, back and forth, and it's like a spin cycle. Odysseus almost gets home, and then he gets buffeted back over and over. It's like he's in a washing machine, and he just keeps getting spun. But then he takes a different path. It's the path of higher self, and he is assisted by Athena. And there is one more constellation whose stars are crossed by this path that is not included in the zodiac, and that is Ophiuchus, I've made mention to it many times. Ophiuchus is a pivotal figure. You can see the foot of Ophiuchus goes down. One foot is clearly crossed by the ecliptic. So Ophiuchus is in the ecliptic path, but above it. In the world, but not of it. Ophiuchus is along the Milky Way going upwards. That is a different path. I'm going to draw in the Milky Way. And above Ophiuchus is Hercules. We made mention of Hercules. These are very important constellations in the myths of the world. Hercules plays a god figure and often the most powerful god figure like Zeus or like Shango of Africa, the Yoruba nation. Uh, Thor is a powerful divine figure. So this is the pathway towards reconnection with self through that pivotal higher self we have access to 
the divine realm or divine inspiration. In fact, Athena, she springs full grown from the head of Zeus is associated with Ophiuchus. She's a wisdom goddess. She gives divine wisdom to Odysseus. She helps Odysseus. She and Hermes are the two that come help Odysseus. And Odysseus, now I'm going to draw in the Milky Way. He goes, finally, he keeps going on the spin cycle through the lower elements. I'm just giving a taste of how this esoteric system, I am convinced after many years of trying to figure this out, how it's working. The Milky Way path is a different path. And it goes up past Ophiuchus, and it continues past Hercules, and it gets up to Perseus, and it gets all the way over to Orion. And in the Odyssey, Odysseus has to go down into the underworld where he makes this sacrifice where he's clearly associated with Perseus, and he's told to do something by Tiresias that associates him with Orion. He's moved a different direction. That is the way of reconnection with self and with reconciliation with the gods. He has to reconcile with, with Poseidon. He, you know, Poseidon's mad at him because he lost it. Odysseus lost it when he slew Polyphemus, the son of Poseidon, and he boasted and he, he let his emotions and his, his uh, pride run away with him. And that's what caused all this misery for Odysseus and for his family too. So this is just a taste of what's going on in this system. You can see it in the myths of the world. You can really see it clearly in the Odyssey. And that's why I love the Odyssey so much. And it's such a pivotal and important ancient work of art and uh, treasure, like an inheritance for us to look at, to help us to understand the system. Because the journey of Odysseus is illustrative of our journey metaphorically and esoterically. It's trying to show us these are the pitfalls. This is the situation you're in. You're down in this world of Poseidon, the watery world, the flood. You're talking about the flood uh, in some of your other research that you're doing right now. The flood is metaphorical of our situation. And Gilgamesh, in the Gilgamesh epic, he has to go meet this figure, Uta Napishtim, who has been given immortality, the gods say, because he went through the flood. <laughs> Because you went through the flood, Uta Nepishtim, now you are like the gods. You have to go through this lower watery world to rediscover some things. And Odysseus has to go through this to learn some lessons and to get back to where he's supposed to be and to recover what he's lost. And that's indicative of our situation. That's what the Gospels are talking about. That's what the... Images in the Bible are illustrating these profound stories, very powerful stories, illustrating powerful truths. They're illustrating that truth in many different ways. And the Odyssey is doing that. And the Iliad is doing that in a different way with different metaphors and different illustrations. And so let me just bring up to close. And I do have a couple other, if you want, I could maybe show one or two other things from the Odyssey, but this might you know, be enough to really hammer it home. This is an ancient Greek vase. Again, you can see it down there, a vase. It's a skyphos or a skyphos, a skyphos. I don't speak ancient Greek, but there it is, you know, in the round at the bottom. This is from an old textbook, uh, old, uh, old publication. It's now in the public domain. You can find this picture on Wikimedia Commons. There's Odysseus slaying the suitors, and he has two female figures to his left. So from left to right, we've got two female figures, almost looking like two pillars. That's important. Then we have Odysseus holding a bow at a certain angle, <laughs> holding his feet in a certain angle, pointing his arrow. He's going to slay all the suitors. He comes home. There's 108 suitors in his house. That's a celestial number. It is a celestial reference. It refers to the great cycle of procession. I talk about procession in my Celestial Mechanics online course so that you can understand exactly what a procession is, why 108 relates to it. The number of the suitors 
is given in kind of like not they don't come out right out and say it's 108 they say well there's 20 from this island and 12 from that land and you add them all up it's 108 we know it's celestial so it's Odysseus and his son against 108 young men armed thugs it's like you got a motorcycle gang of 108 dudes swaggering around in your house eating all your food flirting with your wife threatening to kill your son they've got weapons they got spears they know how to use them they've got bows and arrows so Odysseus has to use his wits and Athena has to say you know think about this Odysseus you got to do this right anyway he comes up with a plan where he locks up their weapons basically and then proceeds to kill them all and so there on the right we've got the suitors on the far right there's one he's like lounging on a lounge chair and he's reaching up with one arm out and another one's getting shot almost in the back there as he turns away and then another one's crouched in between holding up a table like a, a elegant looking table hoping maybe this will protect me from the arrows of the bow of Odysseus and if the bow of Odysseus is more powerful than anyone's bow it's going to shoot an arrow right through that these suitors are doomed and they're doomed throughout the odyssey their doom is foretold by the gods like these suitors are going against the laws of heaven they are oppressing they're just lounging around eating other people's work without doing any work themselves they are a, 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 a metaphor for oligarchical uh, rentier activity i would say maybe i'm going a little far but they're living off the livelihood of someone else in an oppressive uh, violent way so Odysseus comes home and slays them. Now look at the celestial references. I'm just going to start with Odysseus. I'm going to point an arrow on the screen to Sagittarius. Look at the bow of Sagittarius. Odysseus is not often associated with Sagittarius, but this artist has clearly identified Odysseus with Sagittarius. You might say, well, just the angle of the bow doesn't necessarily tell us it's Sagittarius. The angle of the body does, but I'm going to show you other constellations that make it perfectly clear. Let's go all the way to the far right. We've got a suitor lounging or reclining with one arm out. That is clearly, we haven't talked about Virgo yet, but those are distinctive aspects of Virgo. I'm going to point an arrow. Look at Virgo. It goes across the sky on her back, legs elevated and raised, and apart as if giving birth, often associated with giving birth, Virgo the Virgin, giving birth. One arm is a distinctive feature of Virgo, reaching out, marked by the second brightest star of Virgo, Vinda Meatrix is her second brightest star, marking her outstretched arm. Her brightest star is Spica in her hip, but that outstretched arm is the distinctive feature of Virgo. Look at that guy. He's reclining on a couch, but he's got an outstretched, distinctively outstretched arm. Both arms are outstretched, but one is obscured by, the artist has obscured one arm to really emphasize the Virgo connection. Now, moving back towards Odysseus, there's another one, a suitor who's angled away, just like Acteon was angled away. He's, he looks a lot like Acteon, actually. He has got one leg extended way out, and he's being shot, not in the butt, but just above in the back there as he turns away to try and get away from the dreaded arrows of Odysseus. That's a Scorpio figure. And Sagittarius is right next to Scorpio in the heavens. Look, Odysseus, go to the right, a Scorpio figure. There's nobody in between them. That is Sagittarius and Scorpio. And then what's in between Scorpio and Virgo? Well, in the artwork, we've got this guy crouching, holding up a table. Uh, he's making himself smaller, but he's holding up a table with legs on either side. What's in between Scorpio and Virgo? Right above this artwork, I've tried to arrange it so that it matches right up. Scorpio, we've identified that suitor. Virgo, we've identified that suitor. In between, suitor with a table trying to hide. That is Libra. Look at Libra. It's a little table. There's other artwork I could show from other centuries where Libra is a little table. It's clear as a bell. <laughs> it's clear as a bell crater. This isn't a bell crater. Okay, what's in between? Sagittarius and Scorpio in the heavens. See that blue line and the blue arrow? 
the Milky Way, the path, the most important. Look on the, on the vase itself, the handles, those are those two circles. There's this beautiful flowering center of the Milky Way, artistic depiction in between Sagittarius and Scorpio. That's the Milky Way. I mean, how much more evidence do you need? If this was a court of law, I think we could convict this ancient artist of putting celestial references into the scene. The whole odyssey is celestial. So I rest my case there. Thank you so much for listening and for letting me get through those slides. And uh, esoteric, it's, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to meet Professor McDonald. I hope that, uh, you know, we can talk again more in the future, but uh, he's given me some great uh, suggestions on, you know, making those criteria a little more formal. But I hope you can see that the Odyssey is a celestial work. It's part of this ancient system that informs the myths of the world, including the stories of the New Testament, but also of the Old Testament, and also of myths of ancient India, myths of Africa, even myths of Australia. I have found evidence to argue from some of the stories of the different Aboriginal indigenous nations of Australia, of the Americas, the Pacific, Asia, China, Japan, the, the the references are all they all actually have parallels very strong parallels it's really hard to argue that they're not part of the same system so i'll, I'll end it there thank you so much